Wonderful. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we are so excited to have Edward Gorbis with us today. Um, we're talking about the fact that Edward finished his MBA online in 2018. And he is now the CEO and an executive coach of Career Meets World. And I'm really excited to have him here today to just share some advice and tips. And um, like I said, he's an executive coach. So he has a lot of information to share with us. So I will let you dive right in, Edward. And um, everybody feel free to have some questions ready. We will be opening up Q&A. Um, so think of some things you'd like to ask and, and know that this is a great space to do so. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me today, Trista. It's really nice to at least virtually be back with the UMass community. I love giving back to just different pockets of my life, but really excited for this. Again, my name is Edward Gorbis, and today's going to be a little bit unique. And we're really going to spend, let's say, the first 15, 20 minutes talking about Mindset 2.0, or as I like to call it, kind of the real science and transformation of limitless careers. Look, I graduated in 2018, and even though I got my MBA, there's a lot of things that I was able to accomplish afterwards, and a lot of it was predicated on my ability to enhance my mindset. And for me, now that I've started my own business and really focusing on coaching for a lot of people who are coming out of grad programs or further along in their career, it's really about how do you create a foundation for yourself and do the mental fitness work where you're hyper successful? So my ask for you is the next 15, 20 minutes, just stay hyper focused, have some questions that pop up and we'll get into full conversation afterwards. So as we do that, I wanna give you a quick background about myself, who I am, why am I even qualified to speak about this? And the truth is that I spent the last 10 years of my career going all the way from civil engineering into senior sales leadership at WeWork before kind of the, the rise and fall of the company. And with that, basically at the start of the pandemic, I started my own coaching practice called Career Meets World. Uh, one fun fact about me is I was actually born in Ukraine. And for me, a big part of my practice is actually serving the immigrant and first-gen population because that's just something that really resonates with me and it's a huge part of my identity. The other thing, as you can tell, I'm a huge mindset nerd. I've spent the last 10 years reading a great deal, learning as much as I can kind of about psychology, neuroscience, spirituality, metaphysics, to combine all of this, to write my own free ebook called Unbreakable Mindset. And another big thing that I like to share, and I'm really fortunate, I've spent a lot of time traveling learning a lot about different cultures, ethnicities, religions, and really understanding kind of the psyche of the human mind. And one thing I think any of us, despite not knowing each other, that we can agree upon is that the last 12 months of our lives have been challenging in so many different ways, right? The world is more fractionalized, it's noisy, it's distracting. So my goal today is to really help create and show you a process where you can channel so much inner energy and strength that I will assure you that the next six to 12 months of your life are going to be some of the most productive moments you've ever had. So with that said, I want to jump in with a simple question for everyone. And my big question to you is really, what do these two spe specific things have in common? The World Wide Web and your brain. So the way I like to ask those questions, whether it's in the chat box or if you want to take yourself off mute, I'm curious what you think these two things have in common. The first thing that came to mind was um, like lots of connections, lots of like different, um, yeah, things connecting um, different parts that maybe don't always make sense. I love that. Close, almost there. I think. I mean, going off of what Anna said, um, like kind of like they rely on networks, like network, networking within the brain and the internet. Love it. And then there's one more in the chat box, constantly absorbing information. Uh, Wendy, Alexis, and Anna, you're all spot on. So what I always like to share with people is that the thing that these two things have in common is that our brain is like a search engine. And my goal really for the next 15, 20 minutes is to help us understand how to use this operating system in a way that 
we have more power, more consistently and really stand unshaken in all of the uncertainty that's happened over the last 12 months. And the reality is mindset and personal development have become a lot of white noise in our society that's really oftentimes masked in a lot of inspirational posts or motivational quotes. I think, look, don't get me wrong. I love jumping on Instagram and looking at a motivational post by Gary Vee or Sarah Blakely. But the reality is most of us have never been truly taught what mindset is. My parents never taught me what it was. My AP psychology teacher in high school never taught me what it was. And here's the thing, this isn't really a new conversation. It's been discussed for thousands of years by some of the most successful people from Buddha to Mahatma Gandhi to Ariana Huffington to Sheryl Sandberg. So here's what mindset really is. It's the developed capacity to utilize your mind and reorient and literally rewire the way that we think. And I would suggest this is fundamentally the most important skill that we can ever develop. It's more important than anything we'll ever learn in a classroom. And this conversation really is about taking back your personal power because mindset's more of a mental technology that's been designed to dehabituate a lot of the negative biases that are holding us back from any of our own pain. And the only thing that's truly holding us back for more opportunities, the only thing that's ever really holding us back for more career development, and the only thing that's really holding us back from more relationships is really mindset. So this conversation is going to be about the conscious reprogramming of your mind, of the reptilian part of your brain. So we get to do this on ourselves and we get to understand what the next evolution of personal development really is. And that's what Mindset 2.0 is. So with that being said, I wanna build on this. And I have a silly yet really important announcement to make, which is that every single experience you have in your life is directly correlated with your belief system. Let that sink in for a moment. This is really important because if you don't understand the way that you actually operate, there's no way for you to tweak your internal systems. And the fact of the matter is when you're stuck in any area of your life where we're not living into unlimited possibilities, it's because we're viewing that area of our life through the constraints and the constructs of limiting beliefs. So we're literally looking at life and ignoring all of the opportunities, all of the possibilities that exist. And it's all because our thoughts are not in alignment, nor are they congruent with what we actually want to accomplish. We're putting ourselves in a truly terrible emotional state, and we're not actually bringing resourcefulness into any area of our life. And it's all because 20, 30, Maybe 40 years ago, you came to some conclusion before you were ever fully conscious. So I want you to remember this. 95% of our beliefs are developed during the first five to seven years of our lives. So let's think about it this way. If you weren't invited to your friend's fifth grade birthday party, but everyone else was, probably didn't feel good. If your teacher scolded you in front of the classroom, probably didn't feel good. If your parents maybe forgot to pick you up from soccer practice or from kindergarten or from day school, it probably didn't feel good. And what's truly happening today is that we're constantly living that conclusion over and over and over again. But what I can assure you and what I work on with a lot of people is that we can actually change this by simply changing our belief system. And it requires a lot of work, but I assure you that literally anybody can do this. So I'm gonna walk you through what this looks like and how our brains actually function. Why is this so important, right? We're talking about mindset so much and I want you to understand why it's so important for us to identify what our beliefs are. And the truth is our beliefs predict and produce our destiny. And I know that everyone has heard, heard this through a motivational post, an inspirational quote. And I wanna sort of explain it to you through the lens of psychology and really layer in a lot of the science behind it. So whatever it is that you believe produces all of the results that you have in your life. And the reason for that is because there's a function of the human operating system called the five primary drivers. And what I wanna do right now is really summarize what are the five primary drivers. And they look a little bit something like this. They start with our beliefs, right? Whatever we believe is going to create or produce the thoughts that are perfectly in alignment with those beliefs. 
right? Whatever you perceive or react to is going to expand in your mind. And that belief is in perfect correlation with that experience. What's interesting is Gandhi had a really famous quote and he said, a man or a woman in today's world is but a product of his thoughts, what he thinks he becomes and that becoming is the feeling. So our beliefs drive our thoughts, our thoughts drive our feelings. And it's really this embodiment of that thought that we can actually study the brain and see that every single time we have a thought, we have a feeling, and that feeling releases a very specific electrical pattern in our brain. And what happens is it produces all these specific chemicals in your body and you experience that thought as a feeling. And if you really look at what happens after that feeling, it always produces some sort of action or inaction or really just being still and not moving at all. And what happens after we produce that action, we lead to some sort of result. And what really happens is that result reinforces your belief. So our belief drive our thoughts, our thoughts drive our feelings, our feelings drive our actions and our actions drive our results which reinforce our beliefs. This is a really important thing to take away because we're actually going to show you how to apply it right now. The way to apply it is through this. I typically go through this exercise in a much longer format, whether it's in one-on-one -on -one or group coaching, but I just wanna show it to you right now and really feel free to take a screenshot, a picture, jot it down in your notebook. But the exercise, if we build off the fact that our belief systems drive everything in our life and we understand that our mind was programmed in the first five to seven years of our lives, we actually have an opportunity to understand that we can make new decisions. And when we make new decisions, we can make new beliefs. Let me share a personal example with you. So the way to go through this exercise really is to look at these three columns. You look at all of your existing limiting beliefs. You don't have to write any of them out. You don't have to share them publicly right now, but you can go through this exercise and essentially you'd write down all of your limiting beliefs. For me, I shared this a moment ago, but I'll share it again. One of my limiting beliefs was in first grade. I had to do a presentation. I distinctly remember this. And my teacher basically said, you should probably never stand in front of the classroom again. I've remembered that for a very long time, yet I'm standing here in front of all of you today and speaking, and I have zero fear. Was this natural? Was this easy? No, but that's where the mindset work comes in because we have the ability to decommission, dehabituate all of the belief systems that don't serve us and actually start to create new decisions and new belief systems in our lives. So the way to do this, write down all of your limiting beliefs. For me, it was not being a great public speaker. And then I made a new decision is that I'm going to the best public speaker that I can for everyone that I serve. And what I did, and the important trick here is to start to train and rewire your brain. The way to do this is to look at all the supporting evidence that you have in your life of all the moments you've ever maybe given a presentation or whatever the other limiting belief that you wanna decommission and think about what are those moments where you've had people actually give you reinforcement and start to jot those down? This isn't a one day exercise. You do this every single day, right? The mental fitness happens every single morning. It's about 15 to 20 minutes worth of work. There's a few other layers that go into this, but this is a big central piece of the foundation. And I assure you this works. The reason it works, there was actually a study done by the Harvard Medical School. And what they looked at was a group of pianists. And they basically wanted to study the electrical patterns inside the pianist's head while they're playing the piano. So they wired them up. They basically had them play out whatever song they want to play out. They looked at the heat map of their brain and then they basically did the exact same study and exercise, but they removed the piano. So they basically had the pianist visualize themselves playing the piano and wanted to understand what was the heat map of the brain? How's their brain actually reacting during that moment? What's fascinating is that it was identical, is that our brain doesn't know the difference between what we're thinking and reality. And the reason this exercise works, and the reason why it's so powerful, and we actually have the ability to decommission our brain is because we're doing the mental fitness. We're doing the workout inside of our minds and visualizing what we actually want our life to look like. I started to visualize what it would look like to stand in front of a Zoom and actually give this presentation, right? We go through that work. 
That is why this is so important. And it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in 30 days, but this is an ongoing commitment to yourself. I assure you that whatever you learn at UMass, you will have all of the technical foundation to go out and be successful. But to truly show up every single day in your career or whether or not you decide to start a business down the road, it's going to be imperative that you stand with confidence and you show up with energy every single morning. And that's why this is so important for us to go through this exercise. So again, I'm always happy to answer more questions, but this is a central part of what I like to teach. And this is the secret sauce really. And now what I wanna do for just a few more minutes is really expand on why this matters. So if we take the notion of belief system being incredibly important and simply apply them to people, what I wanna do is show you how most people operate, how most people operated the last 12 months and how the most successful people operate. Because ultimately, if you showed up here today, you want to be successful in your life. Whatever that looks like for you, I want you to have the mindset right so that you can show up successfully and powerfully in whatever it is that you do. So first, we're really going to spend a minute looking at how most people operate. What I basically design is what I like to call the inverted triangle. Really sophisticated name, but what we're going to look at right now is this inverted triangle. So if we think about belief systems, right? Belief systems, they drive our thoughts, they drive our feelings, they drive our actions, they drive our results, which reinforce those beliefs. So what happens is most people operate from a place of limiting beliefs, right? All those beliefs that were formed in the first five to seven years of our lives are how we show up every single day. What ends up happening is if you wake up in the morning and you start to operate through limiting beliefs, you end up in a low state of energy. Think about all those mornings where you woke up and you thought I have to give a presentation, I have an exam today, I have to pick up my kid from school, whatever it might be, we end up in a low energetic state. What ends up happening after we're in a low energetic state? We have very limited clarity. We don't have clarity about what we actually need to achieve or want to achieve that day. From there, remember all those mornings where, where you woke up you're lethargic, you're not in a good mental state, what ends up happening is you ask yourself a million questions that are not strategic, they're not thoughtful, and they really don't lend to a great state. What ends up happening is you end up in a place of fear. When you're in a place of fear, you have to take some sort of action throughout the day, but that's typically a reaction. And that reaction is a function of all of our limiting beliefs. So this is truly how most people operate. It's not because they want to operate this way. It's just nobody has ever taught them a different framework. So the beauty is we get to invert this today and really help you understand how most successful people operate, right? How Sheryl Sandberg operates, how Mahatma Gandhi operates. This has been consistent throughout time. That mindset is the foundational piece of anyone's success. So when we flip this upside down, and we do the actual mental fitness work every single day and we think about what our empowering decisions or empowering beliefs are, we start from that place. We start to rewire the brain. We start to decommission these old neurosynaptic connections and we have empowered beliefs or decisions that we're making actively and consciously. That lends to more energy, lends to more clarity. And instead of asking ourselves a hundred different questions, we're able to ask ourselves a few strategic questions. And if you ask yourself a few strategic questions, instead of fear, we result with courage. We have confidence to go out in the world and take thoughtful action. None of you would be here today at UMass Amherst in the program if you weren't in a place of empowerment when you're actually going through the application process, right? You had high energy, you had clarity on what you wanted to do. You ask yourself the right questions about how do I actually get into the program? You develop the courage, you develop the confidence, and then you took the action. This is how successful people operate. And they do this on a daily basis. And the way that they do this is by actually focusing on their belief system. So I'll leave you with this is that we get to choose. We get to choose if we wanna operate like most people or like successful people. And the truth is, the last announcement I'll make is that you are one belief away from everything you want in your life. Go out and do the work. Thank you, I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, clearly you can tell I'm hyper passionate about this, but uh, Trista, I'll pass it back to you.
Great, thank you. Thank you so much. Does anybody have any immediate questions or examples or things they'd like to kind of work through? You can either drop in chat or you can unmic as well. Aha, Swapnil says, can you talk more about the imposter syndrome and how to deal with it? <laughs> yeah, so I'll always say this, and I think and this is part of me kind of helping train everyone as well, is that any question we ask ourselves, right? So what I always tell people is questions kind of predict the quality of our life. So they're clearly correlated with the outcomes that we have. So the quality of the questions you ask yourself will dictate the quality of your life. So swap now to your question, how do you get rid of imposter syndrome? I'm always going to have the same answer and it always requires the same amount of work. And the truth is that's kind of the beauty of this is that you can apply it to any question that you ask yourself that lends to a limiting belief. And that's what this really is, is when swap now, when we go through the work and we look at the fact that there is a question that you ask yourself, right? If we look at the model of most people and how they operate, the reason you're asking yourself this type of question is you're operating through a place of limiting belief. So work backwards. Why do I have this limiting belief, right? Again, I'm not trying to replace Western medicine or therapy. For me, it's about working with ambitious people who kind of get stuck in their own ways because of things we've programmed ourselves to do. The beauty here is that when you go through this exercise and you're honest with yourself about what are some of those limiting beliefs, and then you look at what do I just want my belief to be? So if you have imposter syndrome in maybe product management, let's just use that as an example in that you've never done product management. A lot of people from MBA programs transition into it. And basically you wanna come in and tell yourself that I believe and I've made a decision that I am the best product manager, okay? Right away, your mind's going to find all of those things. Remember the first thing I said, your mind's like a search engine. It's going to find all of the answers. It's like a Google search engine. And it's going to find all the things in the back of your brain that are going to support why you're not a great product manager. Okay. But I want you to stop yourself and ask, what are things that product managers do that I am good at? Right? Start to find the supporting evidence in your life about why you're good at X. It doesn't have to be product management swap. You know, I'm not sure what it is that you feel like you have imposter syndrome in, but plug in whatever it is and start to look at all the things in your life that actually prove that you have this skill set or that skill set or this other piece. Nobody has it 100% figured out. I don't care what position you're in. But the truth is, you have the ability to convince yourself. It takes work. It doesn't always feel good. There's going to be moments where you're going to wake up and your old neurosynaptic connections come back and they say, okay, this is exactly who you are. But that's not true. It doesn't have to be true. Remember, our brain doesn't know the difference between what you're thinking and reality. That is a powerful takeaway because what we see and what we perceive of the world is just a reflection of what's going on in our mind. So if we translate that into something else and we start to give ourselves permission to create new belief systems, you're going to basically get rid of imposter syndrome for X. And when that works and something else pops up, now you have a formula for yourself. So I hope that answers your question. I know I can't see uh, faces reactions, but that is the formula and the recipe for success here. I'm outside, but yeah, thank you so much. Of course. What else? Let's do rapid fire. I, I love conversations. This is how I operate. I have a I question. Have a question. Oh, go yeah. ahead, Wendy. Jump in. You next. <laughs> um, I I love this. I would love to know um who like who are your inspirations? Like where are you what are you reading? And um and also I read once uh in uh the seven the seven spiritual laws of success by Deepak Chopra, that uh, there is no difference between, or the only difference between us and like a blade of grass is really um, just the information and um, like the speed at which it, it, because we're all made up of like carbon. And you, you know, you were talking about, you were into quantum physics and stuff like that. And I just, 
I was like, well, let me just throw something completely off the <laughs> off the wall, Adam, and um, just kind of like see where your where your inspirations are and what you think about that notion that you know we're there's there's not much that separates us and all our complexity from a simple blade of grass. Yeah, it's a great question, Wendy. Funny thing is that Deepak Chopra is definitely one of those people that I spent a lot of time listening to and learning from. I think there's a multitude of people that really are hyper successful, right? That's why we look at the success model and they all have the same underlying principles. And that's, I'm borrowing a lot of what they say and basically created my own formula. But I think what he's talking about and uh, back to my quantum physics days in college, but the, the truth is if you think about kind of the difference between humans and any other species on the planet, it doesn't matter if it's a plant or a walking animal, is that the only difference, unlike having an amygdala, right, which all animals really have, is that we have a frontal cortex, we have a hippocampus, and we're able to process emotion. So that is kind of the only thing that truly separates us. Most people operate from their reptilian brain, right? You process a, a belief, and then a thought, and then a feeling, and that happens instantly. Most people experience life through a feeling. So what ends up happening, the, the beauty of all of this work is that ultimately you'll notice the feeling, you'll see it. And then eventually, as you do the work, as you start to create a new belief system in the moment, you'll realize I don't feel good. I'm not happy. I'm not in a great state of being. I didn't land that job. I got scolded in front of the classroom. It doesn't matter what it is, but you're able to track that feeling backwards now, back to the thought, back to the belief. And you look at the old belief and say, uh-uh. This is not my belief anymore. This is my new belief. It's going to trigger a new thought. It's going to trigger a new feeling. And you get to do this in live time. For some people, it takes a few minutes. Initially, it took me hours to do it. Then it was minutes. Now it's almost seconds where you're in a moment, like I'll be very honest and raw with you. And Tristan knows this. The reason I pushed out this presentation, my grandmother passed away about a month ago. Her and I were hyper close. And we taught, she's like a second mom to me. So the truth is, I think most people wouldn't be able to do this presentation or stand up in front of a room if they were in a place of suffering. Because for me, there's two states of living. You're in suffering or in your beautiful state of being. Suffering is anxiety, fear, depression, sadness, all the things that no human truly wants to feel. Beautiful state of being is joy, happiness, excitement, curiosity, motivation. And for me, going through the mindset work, dealing with grief and layering in what I've basically teach everybody has helped me come out of this as well. Because through my own belief system, I know that I've been successful because of all of these outstanding reasons and all the support. I know my grandmother would want me to be successful, right? She would never want me to be in sorrow or depression or any of those states. So it's really about in lifetime applying this, no matter what happens in life, even death. And I know that's a little bit dark, but the truth is this works in any setting. So to give you a few examples of maybe people that I follow, there are hundreds and it varies by the week because there's so many people that are inspirational. Um, a huge motivational piece for me is a guy named David Bayer. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's just an up and coming coach who has basically blown up everywhere. Um, I spent a lot of time listening to Tony Robbins. He's not everyone's cup of tea. Um, I really do like Sarah Blakely and, and her inspiration. Um, those are kind of the key people in my life. That's mainstream. The other piece of what I like to learn is kind of Eastern world, how people think there. I think too often we live in this Westernized world and we think that everything that we read on labels or on, uh, on media is true, but the truth is there's other ways that people live and operate and, and they arguably live much happier lives. Uh, and for me, Buddhism is a big thing in my life. Personally, I'm Jewish, but I really value what Buddhism brings. So there's some uh, silly books, but ones that I'd recommend. <laughs> One of the famous ones is called A Buddha Walks Into a Bar. Um, I'll leave it at that. There's other ones that are similar, but it's really important to look at life through different lenses and just observe, right? Not to judge mm -hmm. it and just to observe and understand why do people think this way or why does this work? And for me, I've kind of combined all of those random things I've learned in the world into a practice that works. And honestly, it, it works for a lot of people because 
I never believed in spirituality. I truly looked at the world through the lens of engineering, right? Everything was very black and white for me. If science can prove it, then it doesn't work. Science knows 10% of reality, right? Now, the older I get, the more I understand is we actually don't know what we don't know. So now that we understand how the brain works, how neuroscience can be applied and coupled with spirituality, you get this foundational practice. And I hope that answered your question. Yeah, no, I, I thank you for thank you for sharing that. I love um, Buddhism is actually a really um, it's it's a, a like a pillar in my sort of my my portfolio of mysticism. So I love I love that. Thank you. I'll look that up. Of course. Yeah. What else? So I just have a question about thinking about the practice of doing this every day, or at least revisiting this and making it a system, do you often find that when you're trying to break down, if you know some of these beliefs are, are with us from such an early age, do you feel like that it's hard and you often kind of fall back into routine of believing that, and then you have to revisit it? And is it an ongoing cycle, like every morning that you have to kind of process, or does it become that? second nature it will become that second nature after you do this problem around it depends on the individual and how truthful they are right at the end of the day if you don't do the work for yourself you're not going to be successful but i'd say anywhere from three to six months you'll okay. start to really change how you think and the process is more expansive of what i showed about the success model right so the foundation is really okay go through the exercise of what are your new empowering belief systems that's you take a piece of paper whatever it is your journal and you write down what your new belief system is from there write down all the supporting evidence right no judgment it's just for yourself all the supporting evidence about why these things are true then i typically encourage people to channel energy from within how do you do that is through a deep gratitude practice so to expand on that is you go through kind of a few minutes of gratitude writing down literally everything you're grateful for and then expanding and thinking about all the things that had to happen for you to have all of the things that you're grateful for and what happens internally is you channel so much energy from within then you're in a really high energetic state when you're in a high energetic state what ends up happening is you get tremendous clarity when you have clarity, you start to ask yourself, what do I need to accomplish today? If you're doing this on a monthly planning, what do I need to accomplish this month, right? Instead of asking yourself a million questions, what if I do this? What if I do that? What if I do all these things? You ask yourself maybe three questions. When you ask yourself three questions, you're in a high energetic state, you have a ton of confidence, and then you write down what are the action steps that I actually need to take today? And the good thing is, because you're in a high energetic state, you're going to go on and do them throughout that day. You wake up the next day and you do the exact same thing. And when you habituate yourself to do that, if you couple it also with exercise, so I always say mental fitness is 15, 20 minutes worth of work. You couple it with high intensity, 40 minutes of exercise. I call it the power of hour. And then basically in that hour, you're so energized. It doesn't matter what's going on. This is the only thing that has personally saved me in the last month from going crazy and personally getting depressed is because I continue doing this work. I practice what I preach. I kind of eat my own dog food and it really works. That makes hi, a lot Ed. of sense. Go ahead, James. Uh, hi, Ed. Great hey, talk. Um, so you work for yourself. Correct. Um, what would you say about somebody or people who are going to be working in an organization and we've been talking a lot about organizational culture. They might still have a great organization, but you find that uh, the culture clashes with your, uh, with your belief system. How do you reconcile? How does anybody reconcile with their, their, their strong belief, which clashes with the, uh, an organizational culture? Doesn't mean that the culture is bad. It, it's just clashing with your organizational culture. Oh, sorry, with your with your own beliefs. Okay. Yeah, I think James, there's there's two pieces to that answer. It's a great question, and it's a tough one because the way we look at it, we can't control or change other people, other companies, other organizations. The way I like to look at it is, we're all human beings, and we all operate from the same 
primal instinct, right? We need to survive, AKA we need finances to put food on the table, to put a roof over our head for our families. If we're in a place where we've stabilized ourselves and I'm not here to give financial advice, but if you financially stabilize yourselves and James, if you don't align with the company culture, the harsh reality is nobody is forcing us to work there. So there are steps that you can take, assuming you have the foundational piece. Look, I understand that everyone comes from a very different background, but if you build yourself that, if you afford yourself that afterwards, if you're really not aligned with the belief system, there's two options, right? We can either help influence it, which isn't always, it's often the path of least resistance, or we look at other companies that align more with our belief systems where people come and go at companies, right? A lot of people post MBA will naturally go back into the workplace. I did this myself. I think the beauty in life, and I'm not saying this is the only pathway, plenty of people have successful careers and they align with the belief system of companies they might join a startup or even more so they might start their own company. So it's, it's not that we're ever gonna change the belief systems of other people. We just have to be true to ourselves. And that's the fastest way to live in that beautiful state of being, right? Because ultimately what I also want people to understand is that when you have a moment when you feel unhappy, even if you've done all the work in the morning, right? And you have a moment where you're unhappy, you're gonna, automatically, now that you know this, is program yourself to understand, okay, and recognize I'm in a place of suffering. And I wanna be in a place of beautiful state of being. So you think about what are your true beliefs and you let yourself back into that state. You're not gonna be able to change what your company does, but you get to choose how you react to it. Most people end up reacting because they're in a place of limiting beliefs and they're not true to themselves. They're not living a life that's congruent with what they really want. I always want you to be in a place where you're in a place of empowerment. You understand what your true beliefs are. You're honest with them and you're actually showing up in the world through that lens. So there's no magic or silver bullet to this because we can't change what companies say or do or their corporate policies change all the time. We get to build a foundation for ourselves and then expand on it and not settle for anything less than what we truly want. Awesome. Drive safely. I love that. We have a really good question in the chat, which is something that I also was just discussing with my colleagues earlier in this conversation, but talking about, so during the a curious during the pandemic, if you have run into people losing their social skills over the past year or feel that they have lost their, their, this social skill, any recommendations on how to handle the anxiety of returning back to normal in a social sense? So how to kind of break down everything that we've dealt with this year when we have to return back to the office or classroom or life? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, and it's going to be wrapped in the same exact response. And you're going to start to see the pattern of how this thinking operates and works. But the big headline that I'm going to tell you is I want you to play offense and not defense. What that really means is when you're playing offense, you start to, again, putting this into practice, you're going to look at why were you actually good in a social setting before the pandemic started? What are all the reasons and all the supporting evidence in your life while you were able to build relationships at a bar, at a restaurant, at a meeting, at a lunch break, at the coffee shop, wherever it is that you were able to build relationships with people. Why were you good at it? None of that has disappeared from the search engine. It's still in the back of our brain. All of those neurosynaptic connections exist. We just have to access them. So the way to do that is to prompt the right questions in your brain. So again, I always want people to stay with this metaphor of a search engine because if we put in the wrong question in a Google, we're gonna get the wrong answers. So you put the wrong question in your brain, you're gonna get the wrong answers. Start to ask yourselves the right questions. And the question really becomes, why am I good in a social setting? Great, your brain's gonna give you all the right answers. You're gonna find all the supporting evidence. And rather than coming at it from a place of defense, oh, I haven't interacted with somebody for, I don't know, six, 12 months. No, I've previously interacted for five, 10, 15, 20 years with people. And most people actually receive me well in a social setting. I'm able to build strong relationships. I'm able to network with people. So I'm going to go and continue doing all of these same things over and over and over again. I don't really care what happened in the last 12 months. 
I get that it doesn't feel that simple and you're probably going to think, okay, I get it, but I still have the anxiety. It doesn't happen overnight. Do the work, commit to doing the work, do the mental fitness. I promise you, whenever we truly step back into some semblance of normalcy, you'll have your confidence back. So hopefully that answers your question. I'm curious about um, if you could just give us a bit more guidance on how to find the, the right question. Um, you know, I think a lot of the time, uh, I guess, I, I don't know, I guess, is it better to go more specific if you're trying, if you have like a vague feeling about something um, and kind of flipping it to find the, the positive evidence, let's say, sometimes that can like feel like too it can just like feel like you're bullshitting yourself um and and so i'm just i'm just curious about yeah kind of like figuring out how to um what might be the right question and how to get there um and yeah i'll just leave it at that yeah so that in itself is a good question anna but i'm also curious if you can expand on it Do you, if you want to is there a specific example that you're open to sharing Mm. Um, I guess I, I have a lot of trouble like going back and forth between what I want to like prioritize in my life. Um, and you know, there's definitely the like financial stability part that I want, but I also, um, So I guess knowing whether I will find my way in life, maybe that's like the broadest question and not believing that I can know or will choose the right things if we just wanna get real. Yeah, no, I love that. Uh, let's get real deep. So a big part of what I work on one-on-one, -on -one, I'm not here to sell anyone, but what I want you to understand is I go deep on talking about spiritual vision with people, right? In Western society, we're all, ask the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Where do you want to go to college? What do you want to do after college? Where do you want to go to your MBA program, right? It's all very systemic. We never give ourselves permission to actually think about what we value, what we care about, and what our perfect life would look like. Giving ourselves permission to actually think about what does perfection in our mind look like? You don't need to tell anyone. You don't have to post about it but giving yourself permission to think about that and expand on it. And then from there being true to yourself, it's not that you're gonna get there tomorrow, you can flip a switch and you can start living out that perfect dream, but at least having clarity around that, right? So your initial question was really about questions, ironically. But the thing here is, is that when we think we're lying to ourselves or BSing ourselves that we're tricking our mind, the truth is that's the purpose. See, it feels uncomfortable because we think we're lying to ourselves, but the only way to dehabituate your brain is actually to start thinking differently. It is binary in our brain. Our brain doesn't know the difference. Remember that we've proven this through actual neuroscience. So you're doing the right thing. And the reason it feels uncomfortable is because your brain wants to be lazy. Your brain wants to go back and access all the information that has been stored wired the right way and easy to access. It operates a little bit like a spreadsheet. It's a very simplified way of explaining it. But what I want you to do is go within that spreadsheet and actually access the piece of information that matters, right? And that's where it might feel like you're lying to yourself, but you're giving yourself permission to actually go find the right answer that helps you, that puts you in an energetic state. And the more time you do that, the more time you override the feeling you're going to just access more of that piece. It's gonna shine a light. It's gonna put more energy literally and physically inside of your brain. It's gonna put more energy into that specific space. That is more of the metaphys metaphysics part of neuroscience, but that's actually how our brain works. The feeling creeps in because of an old limiting belief, not because of your new lim or new empowered belief. So what I want you to do again, when you go through this exercise and you do it consistently, I assure you, you're going to feel different. There's a lot more things to layer in, but this is a huge part of this exercise and why it works. So what I want you to do when you ask yourselves questions 
is you're going to start to at least recognize, right? Part one is recognition, is make the unconscious conscious. So what I want you to do is look at the questions that you're asking yourself and write them down. The other thing I'll share with everyone is that we have 60 to 70,000 thoughts a day. We can't process all of them. That is why journaling is a huge part of life. And that's why I think the people who are successful actually write down what they think. So when you start to write down certain questions and it's okay, right? The goal is to improve. It's not to judge ourselves. It's to actually improve and go through the work and write down what are some of these questions. So if you start to write down questions, you're gonna notice patterns. And you're gonna know right away because humans are naturally judgmental, you're gonna judge the question. And I want you to ask yourself, is this a limiting question or is it an empowering question? If you expanded it and it created a tree diagram, what is it gonna to lend to? So if you know it's gonna lead you down a path that it's gonna end up in a negative state, low energy, poor emotions, what I want you to do is just scratch that question. Literally draw a line through it and start to visually see that you don't wanna ask yourself these types of questions. Reverse the question, frame it in a way that allows your, man to be, your mind to be expansive. When you're expansive, you're going to start to access all the other things you've ever experienced and learned in your life. When you do that, you're going to start to see the actual clarity around what you want to take action in, and it's going to feel a lot better. You do this consistently. That's the only way your brain's going to start to work. Again, most of us, unfortunately, weren't taught this between the ages of five and seven. So the beautiful thing is if you're a parent or you plan on being a parent, you can apply this with your kids and you can actually create a incredible human being by providing them the love and support and the structure and the encouragement the right way. So every, I've been fortunate, I had really supportive parents, maybe too supportive, but on the flip side, I had external experiences that we couldn't control, right? I had a teacher who basically told me I was terrible at public speaking, and it took me a really long time to dehabituate that pattern. But here I am and standing here and actually being able to share this with you. So, and I promise you, you can do this. Give yourself the time and permission to figure out what you truly want in life and then start to work towards it, right? There's always gonna be bumps and bruises and there's always gonna be speed bumps on the road. But the faster you do this, as I like to say, you basically create a personal GPS system for yourself. So you're gonna be able to figure out where you wanna go, how you wanna get there, what it is that you truly believe and start to operate from that empowered state of being. Does that answer? Does that help? Good. Trista, I see there's one more question. I'm going to try to speed read it. Yeah, no problem. I can read it too. It's from Jessica. So she says, building off of Anna's question, one of my biggest fears is stagnation in life, in career, health, fitness, socially. I've always been chopped it up to being a true Gemini and thus have stretched myself incredibly thin by having so many projects. That sounds very relatable. I have been rejected for having a resume that's too diverse. So although this may not seem limiting, it is very, very, in fact, very frustrating because satisfaction feels unattainable. How can I implement the process to find clarity? That's a great question. Mm, deep. So <laughs> the good thing is, if you look at my resume, it looks like I'm a generalist in a lot of things. I went from civil engineering to program management to customer success to sales leadership to coaching. A lot of things as well. The right people in our lives will respect that. And what really matters is our ability to convey our story in a way that is clear and confident and actually tell people what it is we want to do, right? So if you're looking for a job, if you're starting a business and they want to know your background, it doesn't matter what it is. It's really about being able to tell your story in a confident way. So the question isn't so much about why do people portray you a certain way is how can they portray you the way that you want them to portray you. The way to do that is the actual mindset work, right? Is to, rather than have all these different questions floating in our brain, focus on one empowering question and then start to get clarity around what it is that action is. So if the action is, and the reflection is that you're not actually getting the story across to people, how do I improve my story? How do I get feedback? Be open to that feedback. Adjust, iterate, practice, do it over and over and over again until you find the right people in the world that actually resonate with your story. 
trust me, when I set out on this endeavor to start my own business, I had limiting beliefs. I'm a human being. They still percolate to the top. I never started my own business. I was successful in the corporate workspace, but starting a business, finding clients wasn't something that I knew how to do. But I knew that if I stayed true to myself and taught and coach people and just share this information, good things will happen. I believe the world's abundant. There's more than enough opportunity. There's more than enough resources for us to do what we want. What we don't have a lot of is time. So don't waste time. Go out and do the work. Commit to yourself and actually go out and make this a constant practice in your life. You're welcome. Again, I'm also happy to connect with anyone afterwards. LinkedIn is where I like to hang out uh, for better or worse, but I can always chat with folks more there. But happy to answer more questions for the next 10 minutes. Yeah, does anybody else have another question they'd like to jump in on? This is a shorter question. Um, I'm just curious about how you like um, got into coaching and sort of how you really like started that. Great question. I think I've liked helping people since I was five years old. Uh, it's right. You and I talked about kind of spiritual vision and what you like to do. So when I went to this practice, my wife and I got married in 2019 before the pandemic, fortunately. Uh, and basically her and I had this conversation around, okay, we've had a successful nine, 10 year career. What do you want to do the next 10 years? Right. So when we had the conversation, I kind of just blurted out that I want to do coaching. She said, why do you want to do coaching? She obviously knows that I love helping people, but I've always loved volunteering kind of mentoring, facilitating conversations. I ended up building and leading teams. But what I enjoyed the most, the kind of common denominator across all of those was really just giving back to people and watching people light up, right? And watching people feel more empowered. For me, I get my high from inspiring other people because I want more people to be successful. Because if I'm able to even inspire one person on this call today, you can go inspire two more people and three more people and four more people. That's how we're able to share this gift with the world. And for me, I said, okay, I'm going to try this. I'm going to start my own practice because I know what I have to share with people. I've had enough reinforcement. I have enough supporting evidence. The fact that people actually value what I share. I've helped enough people. I've volunteered at enough places. And I said, okay, I have enough knowledge around the business world. I've done enough throughout my career to go out and launch this. Now I just go to have to go out and find clients. What ended up happening is I had this idea at the beginning of 2020, didn't really know that a pandemic was gonna hit and that everyone would show up online and live there. So I look at life as everything is an opportunity. Unfortunately, chaos breeds opportunity. There's plenty of successful people in the last 12 months who came out of the woodwork. I don't care about your Elon Musk, your Jeff Bezos who made more money, irrelevant. I'm talking about the people who looked at the last 12 months as a real opportunity to grow. So for me, it was just an opportunity to network, to connect, right? Um, I apologize. I don't remember who asked the question about kind of just the social skills element. I said, I love to network. I love jumping on calls with people. So I made it a point every single week to continue networking with at least two or three people. So I posted more on LinkedIn. I did more videos. I started my own podcast. That led to more conversations. I, every single time I jump into a conversation, I ask that person, can you introduce me to two or three more people? Do the same thing with every single person I meet. I expanded my network. I expanded my confidence, right? That continued to reinforce my belief system. And here we are. That's how this all works. It doesn't happen overnight, but it starts with aligning on what your true vision in life is. For me, it's just helping people. I wake up and ask myself one strategic question. How do I help three people today? That's it. Where that leads me, I don't know. I mean, yes, I work with clients or I jump on a presentation. I'm hopefully helping more than three people right now. But for me, that is the epicenter of who I am and how I think and how I operate. So once you do that for yourself, once you give yourself the clarity, and then you continue to do this daily, I guarantee you're going to have a much more empowered life. I completely agree with that, Edward, too, because I feel like it's so easy, especially students who are balancing school and family and just life and work. And I think it's so easy to get hung up on all the all the things that have to be accomplished. And like for some reason, you like make a list and, and all of a sudden your list is like two pages deep and you realize you're not going to get to half of that 
And so thinking realistically, like what can I accomplish in this day and what my priorities are, I think is so important. Absolutely. I have time for one more if anyone has a question. Anybody have a final? Oh, can I ask a quick question? Yeah, of course you can. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thanks, Ed. Yeah, so my question is, I think you already uh, touched base on that a little bit. So I have a, like a limiting, uh, my, uh, belief is uh, my English is my second language, right? But I do want to be a better public speaker, just like yep. you, uh, you had. So I just wondering if you can just quickly walk us through the process briefly. Yeah, how, how can I change my mindset to see, oh, actually I do have what needs to become a, uh, to be a better public speaker, right? Yeah, absolutely. So Ben, this is kind of near and dear to my heart because sure. um, I was born in Ukraine. I'm fortunate I don't have an accent, but my parents do, and I've seen them be successful throughout their career. But again, they struggled because they had an accent. So for me, I can empathize with the story a little bit. What I wanna ask you is, have you done public speaking in the past before? Uh, yes, yeah. Okay. How did it feel? Uh, of course, we'll be nervous, right? I think most of the people will, will feel that, yeah. Was it in English or a different language? It was in English, yeah. Most of my public speaking. How many people were in the room? Uh, I had like for my uh, PhD my thesis defense, there will be probably 20 plus people, right? Okay. And then for other presentation will be probably, I think most of the time, I think the, the one time we had like probably 40 people, yeah. Okay. Right. So if I asked you today to go give a presentation to 200 or 400 people, could you do it? Uh, I will hesitate. If it's you will hesitate. Yet. Right. <laughs> so the, there's a couple ways. There's the mindset element of how to break through this, right? The reason I led you down that path is because I want you to see you've done this before. You've <laughs> stood in front of people. So the question really becomes, what is different between 20, 40 people or 200, 400 people, right? And the difference isn't the amount of people. The, the difference is your mindset. So the difference yeah. is your ability to truly understand and believe that what you have to say, not how you say it, is what matters. How you say things, how you come off, public speaking, I think most of us have learned in some capacity, it's really 20 to 30% of what you actually say. How you say it, how you show up, how you use these hands that were given, right? All of that is what really matters. So deconstructing what it is you truly fear feel fearful of and understanding where that limiting belief might come from. Look, Tony Robbins, when he gets on stage, he still has butterflies. It doesn't matter if you speak to 10,000 people, 100,000 people, people get nervous. But when you're on stage, you start to forget. The reason you forget is because you've already practiced it, right? This is where the mental fitness work comes in. I understand that the accent is a distinction, but that's all in our minds, right? There's elements and some people I've worked with and I've worked with a lot of different immigrants now that do have accents and what I say is I can't help you with this, but there are speech coaches. If you wanna soften your accent a little bit, if you wanna to learn to speak differently, that's accessible to you. The only thing you have to do is ask yourself the question about how do I get that as a resource? If that's what you want. The other piece is really the mindset piece, right? Is to go through this work and remind yourself how did people receive your presentation when you presented to 20 or 40 people? Go find opportunities to present to 40, 60 people, 60, 80 people, keep building up. Your confidence will grow, your supporting evidence will grow, and that wheel that I showed you will continue to expand. That's how this whole thing works. Just do the work, apply this, and commit to yourself. And I assure you, it does not matter how big the audience will get, you will be able to do this. You will be able to break through and you're not going to focus on your accent. You're going to focus on the value that you're delivering and how to deliver it, right? Whatever we focus on, that's what our brain sees. If we focus on the accent, we're only going to think about the accent. Yeah, thanks. Of course. 
Excellent. I just wanted to share that I did post um, Career Meet, Meets World, um, the website. I know that Edward has podcast resources and certainly an area to connect with him. Um, I'm a big podcast person, so I listen to podcasts all the time. So I'll definitely be reviewing many of those. Um, but I just want to say thank you, Edward. I think a lot of this is thinking of getting us all thinking about perspective and building confidence into how we kind of reset our thinking. And it's so important, especially now. And now with people navigating jobs, internships, but also just like you said, we've thinking about socializing post pandemic. So I just want to say thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me again. I love to connect with people. I like to keep things conversational long term. So uh, feel free to reach out and I appreciate it and wish everyone the best of luck. Excellent. Thank you so much. And everyone, thank you for joining and have a great evening. Take thank care. you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.